Andy uh, is an Austinite as well, and, and uh, I, I'm really excited to be ha having security talks here at uh, DevOps Days Austin. The very first DevOps Days Austin in 2012, um, both of the keynotes that we did were both security talks, and we've kind of maintained that all the way through. So I know there's a lot of DevSecOps talks and, and or, or kind of movement in the industry, uh, but we've been we've been kind of participating that with that ever since uh, ever since the very beginning uh, here in Austin. So uh, Wendy Wendy's a good friend. She's given me a lot of good advice over the years, and. Um, uh, we hang out in Austin, but also in other cities. I find that that happens quite a bit. Um, but uh, Wendy's uh, been a CISO at, at several companies, and now she's over at Duo, and uh, she has incredible insight uh, that uh, I, I don't. It's, I think it's really rare to find in, in the security community um, and, and technology community at all. So, anyways, Wendy, I'll let you take it away. But we're really glad to have you here. So, thank Thanks. you. Thanks. Thanks so much. Can you see me now? Can you see me now? Can you see me now? <laughs> yeah, James has it easier than I do. Um, th thanks so much for having me here. Uh, I really love Damon's talk about toil, and now we're going to talk about trust. God, when I come over here, I can't see you guys, and when I come over here, I can't see... <laughs> I, I give up. So we're going to talk about what I call denial of trust attacks. And... What is that about? You know, we all know about how trust is being eroded, especially with propaganda, um, with fake news, with things that have been altered, uh, but also how our trust is being eroded in institutions through data misuse, through overly broad collection. Um, you know, we're going to protect your data right as we sell it to these other 50, you know, organizations. Uh, and then, of course, there are breaches, just the failure to protect the data. Any of that is, uh, and all of that has been eroding our trust in technology, in society, in the companies that run this. But could this get worse? Oh, yes, it can. So hang on. Here we go. How could this become a more systemic sort of attack? I don't think that we are seeing enough integrity attacks yet. Um, I, I, it's not that I want them, but I think we are not seeing them or noticing them enough. Subtle or overt corruption of data. Um, just to undermine trust, because it's also really hard to, to uh, prove a negative. If somebody accuses you of having had your data changed, how difficult is it going to be to prove that there wasn't any change? You can just undermine trust in an institution by accusing them of having had a breach. And then it costs them time and money and reputation to run around and disprove that. Now, before I go any, place, any other place, I want to say, please do not say, are there any blockchain fans out here? Any blockchain fans? You can fight me in the parking lot later. It's good. <laughs> it's all good. Uh, no, blockchain is useful for very specific mitigations of risk, but not for everything, and I'll explain why. Uh, in a little bit. So first of all, uh, speaking of accusing of breaches, I want to tell you that there is no child porn on the blockchain, although somebody, um, somebody uh, made a headline that really sounds that way and it already started undermining trust. You cannot actually technically put child porn on the blockchain, maybe a URL somewhere that would point to something that had child porn on it. But this is kind of my point, that you can accuse anything of anything, and it can already, the people are already primed to distrust what's going on. Uh, the other thing is that you cannot prove a breach. The, this guy, uh, Micah Lee, spent a couple of years traveling around with a honeypot laptop. He would just leave it on purpose in his hotel room and then try to come back and figure out whether anybody had tampered with it. So he did this for two years and he could not figure out to his satisfaction whether <laughs> it had been tampered with or not. It, he could never tell that it hadn't been tampered with. He would look at it and investigate it with every forensic tool he had and even though he didn't find anything, he couldn't prove definitively that it hadn't been touched. So, you know, there are a lot of things that we cannot prove. Uh, the problem with integrity attacks is that they're less noticeable than outright denial of service attacks. And detecting the origin of the change requires a lot of deep event logging that organizations typically don't do. 
Uh, for example, if, if somebody had told you that they had changed something in code and you wanted to do a diff on it, you'd kind of need to know at what point the change happened. Because if you, ch if you did a diff in the wrong time frame, you wouldn't see anything. Or if you see changes all the time, but you want to find the specific ones that were wrong, you have to know the time of origin of the change in order to be able to find it. So time references, especially if you have cascading data changes that are dependent on other things, you have to be able to go back to the origin if you can discover it and figure out what needs to be corrected after that initial wrong change. So the problem is that data might need to be revalidated at scale if you have this sort of cascading change. Imagine that somebody comes to you and says, I am going to make changes unless you, and, and I have access to your, to your systems, I'm going to make changes somewhere, and you won't know where unless you pay me a certain amount of money. Think about how scary that would be, how difficult that would be to figure out. Because first of all, even in organizations that have a fraud department, they typically don't care about non-financial data. And we see this gap between, uh, for example, in retail, where you have a fraud department, they don't care if the wrong person logs into a customer account until they start trying to make fraudulent transactions, then they care. So you have the cybersecurity side that cares about the account takeovers, and you have the fraud department that cares about the transactions, but you know they're not necessarily working together. And businesses tend to be siloed. They're in silos, or as I like to call them, cylinders of excellence, where, <laughs> where they don't have an overview of cross-boundary data. Where They don't have a reason to distrust the data that they're getting from another department. Where do you get this data? I don't know. It comes overnight in a batch job. You know, we just take it. We don't look at it. We don't examine it for integrity problems unless there's a visible effect that you see later in production. And the problem is that the big data trend doesn't tend to include inventory, which is why I say, thank goodness for GDPR. Yes, I really am standing on this stage and saying, thank goodness for GDPR. And why? Because it's making businesses look at what data they have, why they have it, whether they really need to use it or whether they can get rid of it. It's kind of the antidote to the whole big data craze. So if you think about what you need to be able to inventory, what you need to be able to detect changes to, that kind of changes the whole game. This sort of attack can be very expensive. Um, think about a law firm where um, it, it's just like code. Punctuation matters in contracts and in, and in legislation. It really makes a big difference. Imagine being an attorney and standing in front of a judge and saying, Your Honor, on page 82, you can see that it says, and the judge says, that's not what it says on page 82. Think of all the subtle changes that you could make to destroy a contract or to, to alter it. And think of all the billable hours that a law firm would need to go through to have all their interns and, and their paralegals going through contracts to find any unauthorized changes to it. That's the sort of data integrity attack that I'm most concerned about because businesses aren't expecting it. They're not ready for it. Now, another way that we kind of lose trust is in UI design. Has anybody heard of dark patterns? malicious design. Yeah, here's an example. Uh, Cory Doctorow posted this one. I don't know if you can see this circled little smudge here. This is on a mobile banner ad. It looks like a smudge on your phone. And so if you scrape it to try to get it off, it will click and monetize that ad for you. Isn't that diabolical? You, you just sit there and, and, and make money for them thinking that you've got something on your phone screen. So this is a very simple example of a dark pattern. There's a great site called darkpatterns.org that you can look up examples of this sort of malicious design. There are things like bait and switch, where you think you're signing up for one thing, but you get something else. Something gets added to your shopping cart that you didn't choose. Uh, confirm shaming. I'm sure everybody has seen this when you book a, an airplane ticket, and it tries to offer you insurance, where they say, you know, you have to click on, yes, I choose not to protect my investment. It's like, 
Yes, I choose to let the orphan starve. You know, you have to click on that. It's kind of like what Damon was talking about with guardrails, except these guardrails are taking you in a malicious direction or a dangerous direction, kind of guiding you there. Um, the Roach Motel, we have been conditioned to expect certain types of workflows online. Um, and when you get down a certain workflow, you, you should be able to return to something or redo something, but they can design the UI so that you can't do that. Or trick questions like, yes, I want to not cancel the cancel that I was just starting. Wait, what? Have you ever tried to do a con confirmation screen on a cancel operation? It's really hard to figure out how to, to tell them how to do the right thing. No, I don't want to cancel. So there's a lot of abuse of intuitive UI design. Think about red, yellow, and green. Red, yellow, and green, you know, in, in um, North America, red means danger. In China, it can also mean good fortune. So if you're trying to, you know, warn somebody, what color would you use? We expect tick boxes to behave in a certain way. Generally, if you have radio buttons, you can only choose one thing and it deselects another thing. And generally, if you have tick boxes, you might have the option to tick more than one thing. Um, there's anxiety that you can create through artificial scarcity. You know, your session is about to time out. There are only five tickets left. Hurry, you gotta buy this. And the goal is to make the user make a security decision that's not in their best interest. So let me ask you, how many people spend most of your day deep down in some layer of your mind worrying about your battery percentage on your phone? You're thinking about it right now, aren't you? Now that I've said it, it's itching. Now you want to look. Now you really want to look and see where your battery life is at. This is the sort of thing that the sort of anxiety, low level anxiety that we didn't have before, but we do have now and that can be manipulated, that can be used against us. And the other problem with malicious design is that it's hard to tell, it's not extra code necessarily. You might have to be a UI designer to tell that this UI is just so bad that it has to be on purpose. Otherwise, it's not like malware, it's not like a backdoor, you can't find it in the code. And the other problem is that unfortunately we have a lot of what I call engineering grade UIs. They are really bad, I get really cranky when I see them. Uh, as an analyst, I used to look at all sorts of user interfaces. And so we have been conditioned by certain types of user interface operations, and yet we can't and we shouldn't really trust them. We also can't trust ourselves. Surprise. First of all, there's bias. Uh, we've all heard things about algorithmic bias to the point where um, people like Amit Elazari are calling for bug bounties on biased algorithms to try to debug and figure out where the bias is before, you know, before we put it in production. I was just talking with somebody yesterday who feels that the next wave of attacks could be about subverting the inputs into machine learning because uh, people are playing around with that already. So there are lots of avenues where, you know, if you think about it, machine learning is just another type of program. If you tamper with the inputs, you can affect the output. We are also not really capable of doing some of these things ourselves. There's a great interview uh, with Damon Cortese that Tripwire did where he talks about, he was a security expert, an expert in application security, and he talks about how he wrote his own application. And after he finished getting it to work, he went back and looked at it and found that he'd made a whole bunch of security errors in it. Which leads me to believe that we cannot hold two states in our head at the same time. You can think functionally or you know, you can get something to work or you can poke holes in it, but you can't really do it at the same time. You gotta do it in two passes. So this is a, this is a flaw that we have as humans where we can't trust ourselves. Uh, here's another example of the subtlety of, David, uh, of data corruption. So uh, David Sater is a journalist. His son is Raphael Sater, is an AP journalist. 
And Raphael told me this story about how his father was targeted by Cyber Berkut, where they got some of his email messages and they altered them to make it look like he was a CIA influencer. And the way he did it, I don't know if you can see this on the, on the screen, they had the original emails and they had the tampered ones. So you'd think they could do a, you know, a diff and figure out what had been changed and why. But it took Citizen Lab to help them to figure out that another thing that they had done is, you know, they missed catching everything that had been tampered with. They strategically deleted some parts of the text to make a semantic difference. It sounds like rather than it being a Radio Liberty reporting project, it sounds like a very general one. The Rustin, Russian investigative reporting project is gaining traction and producing significant journalism. That can sound really suspicious if you have the right frame of mind and are looking at it this way. And so they didn't catch it because they were looking for changes in word length, they were looking for punctuation changes, they weren't specifically looking for strategic deletion to make a semantic difference. So this is the sort of thing where, again, if we have to deal with integrity attacks, not all of them are gonna be visible in the database. Some of them are going to be in business data, but they're going to be uh, you know, on different layers of meaning. So how do we defend against these sort of things? How do we get people to trust us? We need to be able to trust ourselves, and we have to be able to earn trust from others. So we can do this in a lot of different ways. A as organizations, through honesty and transparency, not just talking about what we're doing, but uh, you know, uh, exposing all of it, which is a, a real challenge, especially when organizations have been breached. Being predictable, if you can count on an organization to do something, if you know what their interests are and you count on them to follow their best interests, even if they're not your interests, you can at least say, you know, well, we pretty much know which way they're gonna be working on this. Capability, you can be as honest and open as you like, but if you can't actually follow through on what you commit to, you know, nobody's gonna trust you. The willingness to commit mistakes is really important, as well as accountability. Sometimes we don't trust organizations to be accountable on their own. We need a third party to hold them accountable, which is where regulation comes in. Remember trustworthy computing from Microsoft? You know, they were working on that, but the thing is that they were talking about trustworthy, secure code that they were delivering but not necessarily the trustworthiness of the people who are using it or the people who are creating it. If you don't trust the purpose of the application, you can't really trust the application even if it has no flaws or no bugs in it. So there was kind of a gap there. So is zero trust an answer? Who's heard about zero trust? Who's heard that phrase? All right, who's already tired of hearing about zero trust? Yeah, I hear you, I hear you. We won't, sp we won't spend on too much time on it, but what does it really mean? You will hear people arguing about this all the time. Um, not trusting anything is not the answer. If we all agree that zero trust starts with the principle of not trusting something just because it's on the inside of your firewall, if we start with that first principle, then we can say, all right, now that we don't trust something just because it's on the corporate network, what do we have to do to get us to be able to trust it? What do we have to add to it? What verification? Um, you will hear, and, and I think part of the confusion with zero trust is that there are two different ways you can use the word trust. You could say that trust is granting access to something without verifying it, which I agree you shouldn't do. Or you can say trust is granting access because you verified it, which is why you will hear companies like mine, like Cisco and Duo talking about trusted access. It doesn't mean that we don't ever trust anything ever, it's just that we're gonna be very deliberate about, about how and why we trust something. Now the thing about trust is that it's not binary. Now my, my Cisco colleagues will trust me to get up in, in, in front of you and talk uh, about these things, but they will not trust me to do a duo deployment because I tend to break things. So you will trust an entity to do something specific and you have to be specific about that. And you have to decide how long to trust them. 
The problem that we've had in the past with security is we would say, okay, you've got the right IP address, we've got the firewall o open for, for you, come on in, do whatever you want, and do it permanently. We've discovered that we have to change that mindset. So we have to figure out how long are we going to trust something, and when do we need to reset that trust. It could be that, and this is something that you know your, your chief information security officer has to think about, do we want to allow an application session for two hours? If it's a very sensitive application, do we want to re-authenticate every two hours? If you do, your users tend to get cranky. So we have to, be, we have to balance how we are going to, tr to revalidate trust without annoying the users. If you're doing workloads that are authenticating to each other, they don't care if you do it all the time. But users tend to care a lot. So you have to figure out what conditions need to be true to trust something or someone and for how long, and how are they going to react to that re-verification. And then finally, let me ask you, what happens to a community without trust? Security is a very, very kind of sketchy community in that we're always hacking each other. What happens to a society without trust? It's hard to get into security, it's hard to get up and talk about what works in security because half of the, the, the um, attendees are sitting there going, pull, they're getting ready to take pot shots at you, you know, and prove that it's not secure. Uh, we're, we're always going after each other. Uh, so for example, uh, did you, have you guys heard of Chris Roberts? He's the guy who claimed to have hacked a United flight and gotten it to fly sideways. Well, I hacked him. We were, uh, we, there was drinking involved. We were sitting in a restaurant and he was showing pictures on his phone and I said, oh, can I see those pictures? And I got his unlocked phone and I posted that to Twitter. Because, <laughs> you know, nobody sees the middle-aged former state bureaucrat coming. <laughs> so the, the problem is though that we need to be able to trust each other, otherwise, we cannot get together and solve problems. So again, we need that honesty and transparency and predictability. We cannot keep playing with each other, you know, and, and destroying trust if we're gonna get together and solve problems. So how do we reinforce trust? We need to get really good at prevention. Uh, so we need really well understood processes. If your customers and your business understand how they're doing something, why they're doing it, and they can talk about it, that's great, and protection of data is also good. You need to be able to detect changes to data and have control over those changes. But this is where you know blockchain unfortunately falls down. You also need trustworthy correction because as I've talked about, we are imperfect, we make mistakes all the time, there are errors that need to be corrected, we need a trustworthy process for doing that correction. So yes, we need things like uh, continuous authentication. We need data validation. If you can think about you uh, who are creating and designing these things, how could you put additional data validation in there? How could you build transparency into your design so that anybody can check into how you're doing something, why you're doing it that way, what is the, the rationale behind it? And can you build in accountability? What is not the answer is to hash all the things because you cannot hash data that's dynamic. It's very, very difficult to build in that sort of thing. So that's why we need better processes that don't necessarily rely on blockchain or on data hashing to build in trust. We need to build in trust at a lot of different points in the development process. Now here's a theory that I came up with when I built this talk, and I don't know whether it's true or not. You can tell me, uh, you know, I'm gonna try to set up an open space. Tell me what you think. I think that you cannot separate trustworthy data in systems from trustworthy people. Now I know that we have tried to build mathematical assurance into code. There have been efforts on that for decades. People have been trying this over and over again. Blockchain is another attempt to do this sort of thing. But I don't think that you can build a system that is trustworthy despite the efforts of the people building it or the people using it. So this is my theory. I'm, I'm happy to talk about it, see if you can figure this out. In the meantime, though, let's just get rid of all the hoodies.
because you know security and hoodies are just making people nervous and they're making us not trust them. So let's take off all the hoodies, or well, let's let's try to take off all the hoodies. Sometimes it doesn't really work. Thank you.